jubilation outside Makerere University in Uganda. During the rule of Idi Amin, students here were massacred, but now Amin is gone, and the students cheer to welcome in a new era and a new president. Yusef Lule, a former professor at the university, becomes Uganda's third president since independence. He's replacing Idi Amin, who for eight years ruled Uganda with a bloody and tyrannical hand. With Amin deposed, he's now believed to be on the run, a wave of relief flooded through the country. Uganda, it seems, is being returned to its people. But it's been a long, hard struggle for opponents of Amin, both inside the country and out. Waiting in neighboring Tanzania has been the Uganda National Liberation Front, headed by Professor Lule and set up with Tanzanian cooperation. Its purpose, to establish a stopgap government for liberated Uganda. Professor Lule impressed the front with his sincerity, his commitment to right the wrongs of the Amin regime, and his determination to return the country to democracy. Professor Lule has thus overshadowed former President Milton Obote, who was widely tipped as Amin's successor. Obote is still hated by some Ugandan tribes who remember the purges by his secret police. But Professor Lule's hands are clean, his reputation untarnished. The Uganda problem is not new. From 1971, when a coup took place in Kampala, we have been ruled by Amin. We have been subjected to all sorts of uh, cruel treatment. Many of our people have died. In fact, the number, we don't know the exact number, but almost half a million people have been wiped out. Our people have fled the country. They live in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, the Sudan, the United Kingdom, the United States. In fact, they have been scattered all over the world. One group that's already left Uganda once, the Asian community. Having thrown the Asians out in the early 70s, President Amin found he couldn't manage without their business expertise, so these people were shipped back in. As the war with Tanzania hotted up, though, the Asians once more hit the road, or rather the air, crowding into Entebbe Airport to catch the last planes out. Just as Amin scared off all the vital Asians, so he lost the rest of the country's professional class. The well-educated business and academic people fled in fear that they'd be the next victims of Amin's unpredictable temper. The harder Amin was backed into a corner by the advancing forces of exiles and Tanzanian troops, the more likely reprisals seemed. At the border with Kenya, the refugee traffic increased to a stampede. <laughs> As the six-month war with Tanzania reached a climax, Uganda's cities emptied. Attention turned to Tanzania for word from the leaders in waiting. Professor Lully, what sort of government will the front establish after Amin falls? Well, the government we will establish will be of a very interim nature to try and establish law and order, and uh, to administer the country, restore services. Um, if you, your question means the nature of the government as to its uh, philosophy, uh, we have not really worked out a philosophy other than the philosophy of self-determination and of liberation of our own country. That is our philosophy. In Tebi, once the pride of President Amin, and scene of one of the most humiliating chapters in his bizarre and bloody career. Entebbe saw much of the fighting between the invading forces from Tanzania and the dwindling forces still loyal to Amin. 
Armin was one step ahead, retreating to the eastern industrial town of Jinja as the invasion force reached Entebbe. The scars of six months of fighting were much in evidence around the Tanzanian troops who'd inflicted it. The capture of the airport was a major victory, proof to the outside world that the liberation forces were gaining ground, a fact the soldiers themselves clearly appreciated. Colonel, when did you last see any sign of the enemy? This morning. This morning? Yeah. Where? Beyond Kampala. Beyond Kampala. Yeah. Towards Ginger? Towards Ginger, yes. Was he busy? And uh, we have also some enemies in Kampala. We're rounding him up. Well, Most of them are surrendering him. Well, were the men on the way to Ginger, were they, uh, yes, were they resisting? <laughs> <laughs> were these chaps on the road to uh, Kampala, to Ginger, were they resisting or not? There, there has never been any resistance, serious resistance. <laughs> The capture of Entebbe yielded proof, too, that Libya had indeed been supporting Armin's fight to stay in control. At one time, there were said to be 2,000 Libyan troops in Uganda, as well as hardware and aircraft supplied by Libya's President Gaddafi. Planes damaged in air raids by the Tanzanians, or crippled by the crossfire, remained at Entebbe, while the Libyans themselves flew out in C-130s and civilian Boeings, taking with them the coffins of their dead. The main target at Entebbe was Armin's formal residence, the State House. Inside the State House, laid bare, were many of the secrets of the President's regime, and in every room, piles of weapons, possibly hoarded for a last-ditch stand. Whether as a symbol of their disgust, or merely to rest their feet for the march towards Kampala, some of the infantry rinsed their socks in Armin's prized pond and made camp beneath his parasols. This Libyan convoy was trying to make its way from Entebbe to the Ugandan capital when it was ambushed by the Tanzanian forces. 81 Libyan soldiers were killed and large guns and rocket launchers were captured. On April the 10th, the Tanzanian forces, led by three tanks, approached Kampala from the south. The pace quickened as the city's skyline came into view. But the jubilant atmosphere was shattered by incoming fire from Armin's forces. Tanzanian and anti-Armin Ugandan troops entered Kampala, tens of thousands of jubilant civilians welcomed them, oblivious to the danger. Celebrations mingled with sporadic fighting continued all the way into town. As things got worse, the big problem was getting civilians out of the way. The soldiers responded and quickly returned the enemy's fire. Soon, they were ready to advance again. Some of the Tanzanian soldiers who'd marched for six months to get here had tears in their eyes as they entered the city center. Although Armin had no elaborate defense of his capital, one of the most desperately defended strongholds was the notorious Makindi jail. For those with the stomach to take it, here was a first glimpse to confirm the truth of the horrific stories which have surrounded this place for the last eight years. Rumors not of mere interrogation or torture, but of sadism and evil. In these cells, it said, 
prisoners were forced to smash each other's heads in with coal hammers. Book upon secret book of photos, all of them showing a mass of secret agents in our means pay, spies who were bribed to inform on their friends and fellow villagers about real or imaginary plots to assassinate the president. One of the secret police's last acts before Kampala fell was to silence the remaining hundred inmates here by lobbing grenades among them. Sites like this spurred on the exiles among the invasion forces heading next to mop up in the north and east. There's nothing seri terribly serious there to do except opening the road to the public. People have been coming from there and there have not been anybody on the road, on the road stopping them. But Idi Amin is still somewhere down that road. He must be in some part of the world in Uganda here, I don't know where. He has to tell us a few things. He has to explain certain things to the people of Uganda. We want him alive. Can you tell me something about what you saw in this building here, where it's state research, and what your reaction to it was? It's a pathetic sight that uh, a human being can s sit under that condition and work is a thing which I have defeated my understanding. It's a terrible sight. I, uh, it's just unbelievable that a thing like that could happen in Uganda. And how do you feel being here after eight years? I feel great. Absolutely great that I'm back home. Um, I'm very happy. I know I have a hell of a lot of work to do, but I feel so happy that I'm back home. With law and order non-existent amidst the chaos of the invasion, there was every chance that many prisoners taken by the liberation forces might not survive long enough to go on trial. In fact, Professor Lule said that he will not condone wholesale reprisals. The government, said his justice minister, will be one of reconciliation rather than revenge. As word of the new president's policy has got round, many of the Ugandan soldiers have actually come forward and given themselves up. But the survivors of Amin's regime have good reason to hate the thugs, bullies and murderers who've prospered through the wholesale killing of innocent people. One grisly reminder of that reign of terror is here on the road from Kampala to Jinja at Namanve Forest. It's one of Amin's killing grounds and only now will local villagers talk about it. So they used to drop the bodies just underneath this, this orange tree. And uh, animals have come and eaten the flesh and the bones are lying and most of them under the grass there. And at times, some kind people have been, have taken the trouble to take off some the, bo the bones and, and bury them. And how many bodies do you think have been dumped in this whole forest? If I say 6,000, even more, mm -hmm. are lying in this forest here. And do they kill people here also, or just bring the yes. dead bodies? Yes, yes, they have been shooting people here. Mm -hmm. You hear they shoot, shoot certain, when they bring the bodies, they, they, they bring some alive. And there's some I mean, soldiers who were not faithful to him have been shot and dumped here. They're especially these Bantu groups. They were brought here and they shot here, leave them there. And you, you, have been, you haven't been lucky enough to find these trees. You could have shown you a tree where they tied somebody alive at night. And they left him there until the following morning when these people have been working in the forest. Found the, the poor man still breathing a bit, panting, and then they untied him. And of course they took him, he was taken, out, he was taken and taken to Mulago. We don't know whether he survived or he didn't survive, but they have been cut and people are on trees with the ropes. And just leaving them to die. Everybody is there, yes? This forest has been the dumping place of thousands and thousands of, of, of people. So at times, there was a time when there were so many bodies in the forest that somebody passing along the main road there, which is, which is at least three quarters of a mile from where we are. If there was a strong wind blowing from the forest towards the main road, eh, you could uh, sense the, the, the stench of the decaying bodies in the forest. Were there women also killed? Oh, yes. If I could uh, 
The place is just over there where they, you find that you see that firewood. I've seen the body of the former barmaid who was working at Kireka. Now, this poor lady, I understand, was befriended by one of the soldiers in the Amin, in the Amin regime. And uh, I think, for one reason or another, she refused the man. So after the closure of the nightclub, they got hold of her, booted her, as the terminology has been. Put, put her in the boot of the car. Put, yes, put her in the boot, brought the body, killed her, made her, took off the clothes and they left her almost nude and they just left her in the, these uh, petties, yeah? And they left the body there. But of course, she was brought from nearby. Her relatives came in the following morning, the following morning and took the body for burial. But many women have been killed. And one of those women, it's claimed, was Mrs. Dora Block, the 73-year-old widow who was one of the hostages held at Entebbe Airport prior to the famous rescue raid by Israeli commandos. Amin always denied any hand in her killing, but locals have had their own suspicions. But on seeing the, the body of a white lady, we realized that this is the one, and of course she was old. They shot her with a white chicken which maybe is a bit of superstition, I don't know. And uh, of course, they left the body there. After some time, the army the, I mean, people came and took the body away. After realizing probably that uh, some reporters could come and take bodies, take photographs of the body. That's it. The administrator at Mulago Hospital outside Kampala still has Mrs. Block's personal effects, her cardigan, her shoes, and even her walking stick. With Armin at a safe distance, he recounted the story of Mrs. Block's abduction. I had a scaffold on the sixth floor where she was staying and rushed to the stairs to see what was happening. I then saw armed men carrying machine guns, literally pulling her down the stairs, and they were firing in spaces to frighten people out of the way. We naturally ran and then observed them as they came down to the second floor where a black Mercedes Benz was waiting. They then pulled her into the vehicle, shut the doors, continued firing in all directions and drove away, and we could still hear her screams as she approached the main gate of the hospital. We know that she was murdered by the security services, the private security police of Idi Amin, on clear instructions by Amin himself. Mrs. Block's youngest son, who lives in Israel, is determined that Amin be found and brought to justice, and not merely for the murder of his mother. With the help of a dear friend of our family, uh, Mr. With his family, he's already launched an operation to trace the missing tyrant. And we are offering a reward of a substantial sum. We didn't decide the exact uh, sum. We're in consultations with the British and Israeli authorities on uh, that problem. We are offering a reward, a reward for whoever will be able to uh, notify where the whereabouts of uh, Idi Amin and, if possibly, to catch him and to bring him to trial in Uganda. Of course, if Amin has succeeded uh, to um, run away to countries like Libya, we don't have uh, any much hope that he will be caught in the near future. But if he is uh, somewhere else in Uganda or in one of the bordering states, we are hoping that uh, he will uh, be found and put to trial in Uganda. Specifically for the death of Mrs. Dora Bach or for a more a wider range of crimes? Well, a more wider range of crimes. Uh, as reported, the new regime has found that he is, uh, he is accountab accountable for the death of 200,000 or more people. Our case is famous, but it's one out of 200,000. Uganda's capital had ground to a standstill long before the takeover. Most people had fled to the safety of the bush, leaving the fighting to Amin's tattered army and the remaining Libyans. And it was a week after Kampala's fall before people began to trickle back and survey the damage. 
with Armin reported variously in Libya, Zaire, or hiding out in the remote north, Ugandans felt safe enough to return by the lorry load. Most of the returning refugees had been away from their homes and work for two months. Two months without pay or any idea when they'd next be able to pick up the threads of ordinary life. A pitiful collection of burnt-out banks and offices greeted Kampala's returning citizens. Every shop looted and abandoned. Picking up the pieces will be quite a task, though some aid could come from an unexpected source. Colonel Gaddafi has offered $400 million for the return of Libyan prisoners of war. This is one case where looters can hardly be blamed for taking advantage of the free-for-all. Ignorant of their suffering, Amin had starved his people of many commodities while selling them to his favoured bodyguards at discount prices. The Tanzanians turned the tables, opening up warehouses and distributing goods such as sugar, which hadn't been seen in Ugandan shops for years. For a while, looting here was actually smiled upon. So popular were the Tanzanian invaders that Ugandans made their job easier, pointing out pockets of resistance in and around the capital as they moved in to take up occupation. According to President Julius Nyerere, his Tanzanian invasion is not intended as a territorial takeover, and he has no wish to install a puppet government. He says the war was fought not against Uganda, but against Amin, for Amin, more than anyone else, says Nyerere, brought Africa into disrepute. No matter how worthwhile Nyerere's motive, it has cost his heavily indebted nation a lot of money, up to a million dollars a day. Keeping the army in Uganda until law and orders returned will also mean a bill that Tanzania can ill afford. Judging by the reaction of ordinary Ugandans, though, the intervention's appreciated and welcomed. How do you feel about the Tanzanian forces coming to Uganda now? I'm just very happy in case the, we, we get overthrew all the whole of Uganda to be liberated in the same way as in Tebe now. But do you mind Tanzanians coming to your country? No problem, they're brothers. But how have the Tanzanian soldiers been treating you? They are treating us okay, not bad at all, because according to them, they, what they want is to liberate their country, not to torture our people. Since they rounded up Armin's supporters, the Tanzanians have had little to do but show their presence. The UNLF feels the country will remain united as long as Armin remains even a remote threat. Meanwhile, the new president is preparing to rebuild Uganda. What does he see as the most pressing problems? Well, the uh, fundamental problem, I think, is that uh, uh, we are about to take over the administration of a country whose people have been demoralized. Fear has been created in their minds. Many of them have lost interest in life because they don't see what they're working for. It will take some time for them to really come out and trust uh, any government because they've been let down so much. There's, of course, uh, the problem of uh, uh, the whole economy is in, in pieces. I, I don't know where I'm going to start, but I'm going to start somewhere. The economy is in pieces. Um, our foreign reserves are now nothing. Uh, the infrastructure is completely destroyed. Um, we have some crops, and uh, of course in Kampala, but uh, we cannot even uh, move them because the, the roads and the rail cannot move. So these are some of the uh, uh, problems we shall be facing. Many people, I suppose, will have lost their houses, their homes, and we may have a number of people in our hands who have nowhere to stay. What are you going to be after? 
Easter Sunday brought worshippers to the Anglican Cathedral on the outskirts of Kampala. They had much to give thanks for. Under pro-Muslim Amin, the church had a very hard time and Christians as a group suffered badly. This Easter though, the shackles were off and the congregation gave vent to their feelings the way Christians do the world over. Their singing said it all. <laughs> 